So do you have half an hour? Five. 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 You can throw the volumes.
Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to you here in the uh, lecture hall and also to you in the far-flung corners of wherever you are online. This is a hybrid meeting. For those of you online, if you look at the top left of your screen, you should see a small green shield. This symbol means that you are using the most up-to-date version of Zoom and that it is secure. Questions can be asked at the end of the lectures, but as you will be muted, please use the chat facility. So use the chat facility to ask your questions found at the bottom of your screen. And then the questions will be read out by Dr. Pam Rowden, a member of the RES editorial team. Okay, and if, if we can try today, if you're asking a question either online or in the theater, please um, mention your name because uh, Observ Observatory Magazine likes to write these things up in detail and it's nice if we have a name for a question. So in 500 years time, they'll know who asked which question when they're writing their thesis, right. Okay, important deadlines for you to note. RES prizes for the best PhD thesis in astronomy and geophysics submitted in 2022. There are prizes for the best thesis in astronomy and astrophysics, the Michael Penston prize and the solar system science and geophysics, the Keith Runcorn prize, and for instrumentation, the Patricia Tompkins Prize. Now the closing date for nomination of those awards, those three awards, which carry a cash prize each of a thousand pounds, so it's, it's worth having, 10% of a thousand, yeah, uh, if uh, uh, well worth having, and obviously very prestigious for the uh, award winners. Um, please make your uh, nominations uh, by 31st of January, 2023. Okay, so if you've got a nomination for those, it's the prize and they present at an ordinary meeting too. Please, please nominate those three prizes by 31st of January. Also, please note that the call for sessions at the National Astronomy Meeting in July in Cardiff is now open. And you're very, very much encouraged uh, across the astronomy, uh, US solar physics and MIST communities at all levels of seniority, put in applications uh, for specialist and cost disciplinary scientific presentation and discussion meetings. Uh, as you all know, NAM's a great fun. I hope you, most of you will have been to one. And good sessions, obvious sessions, I've got of good obvious sessions, but if you have an idea for an unusual session, or as I say, cross-cutting session between disciplines or something, they're particularly valuable. And so that the call has gone out, please respond with suggestions for sessions for that meeting. The deadline for that is Tuesday the 31st of January, so it's not that long way, Tuesday the 31st of January at 1500 hours UTC. It's rather prescriptive, but there we are. So uh, please see nam2023.org for more information, just Google if necessary, and there'll be more information there. Okay, well, on to today's uh, program. First of all, I'm very uh, pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Juan Olde, who is the winner of the Keith Runcorn Prize. He's currently postdoctoral researcher at the Open University in the United Kingdom. He completed his MSc in 2017 at KTH Royal Institute of Technology, Sweden, where he worked on the analysis of Hubble observations of Jupiter's moons. Um, Hubble telescope, I assume that is, rather than Hubble. Uh, Hubble's uh, telescope observations of Jupiter's moons. Juan later obtained his PhD from the University of Oxford in 2021, where he worked on the analysis of isotope observations from the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter. It's a great pleasure to ask you to give your talk. Thank you. Thanks. Well, hi, everyone. 
Uh, so, well, first of all, thanks very much for having me here. It's a great pleasure to be able to present my research at a RAS ordinary meeting. So my name is Juan Alday and I'm currently a postdoc at the Open University, but I did my PhD at the University of Oxford, where I investigated the isotopic composition of the atmosphere of Mars using one of the instruments in the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter under the supervision of Professor Patrick Irwin and Dr. Colin Wilson. And I must say that, well, when I started my PhD, I didn't really know much about isotopes, but as I started reading about them and investigating them, I became convinced that they are actually interesting. And hopefully with this talk, I can convince you that indeed they can tell us interesting things about planetary atmospheres. So first of all, I will be talking and introducing the atmosphere of Mars and putting it into context and explaining why these isotope measurements are indeed important. Then I will be introducing the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter, and then I will finally be talking about the measurements that we've been doing in order to constrain the isotopic ratios in water vapor, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide. Also, let's get started. Well, when we compare some of the planetary parameters of the Earth and Mars, there are actually some similarities. So if we look at the length of a day on Mars, it's about 24 hours as it is on the Earth. And when we look at the planetary obliquity, it's about 24, 25 degrees in both planets, which makes Mars experience four seasons as we do on Earth. However, as there are some similarities, there are also some differences. So Mars is smaller, the, gra the gravity is lower, and it orbits the sun at a farther distance. So on Earth, we orbit the sun at a mean distance of one astronomical unit. For Mars, that's 1.5. But indeed, the, the eccentricity of Mars orbit is higher, which means that the orbit is more elliptical. And the relative distances or the difference in distance between perihelion when Mars is closest to the sun and aphelion when Mars is farther away from the sun, that's more pronounced on Mars than on Earth. And this is important to note because indeed with the trace gas orbiter, what we are observing is that this difference in distance between perihelion and aphelion is one of the main drivers of variations in the atmosphere. But what about the atmosphere itself? Well, on Earth, we've got an atmosphere with a surface pressure of one bar filled mostly with nitrogen and oxygen. But on Mars, the atmosphere is way thinner. It's only seven millibars of surface pressure and it's 96% carbon dioxide, followed by nitrogen, argon, and then several trace gases. And one important thing to note is that under the present conditions of temperature and pressure, liquid water cannot be sustained on the surface. We see water, but we just observe water vapor and water ice, not liquid water. But actually, has it always been like that? Well, there are numerous lines of evidence that suggest that indeed liquid water was abundant on early Mars about 4 billion years ago. And these lines of evidence include the, include the geomorphological evidence. So this is when we look at the surface features on Mars. There are some surface features that resemble very much the river valleys and lake basins, like the ones that we have on Earth. And also, it's not only these surface features, but when we look at the composition of the surface, there are a number of the so-called aqueous minerals that have been detected. And these are minerals that form under the presence of liquid water. But if, if I have said that liquid water cannot be sustained now on the surface, but it was sustained 4 billion years ago, does that mean that the climate of Mars was different 4 billion years ago? And if so, if so, there was a trans was there a transition in the climate from the warm and dense atmosphere that could sustain this liquid water to the dry and thin atmosphere that we have today? Well, one of the hypotheses is that atmospheric loss has been substantial on Mars, so the atmosphere has escaped to space. And this hypothesis is supported by the isotopic evidence. So this is when we look at the at the ratio of heavy isotopes to light isotopes on Mars we see that in several species, they are generally enriched in the heavy isotopes with respect to Earth. So when we look at the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen, for example, it is about five times more enriched in deuterium than the Earth. But this also happens in other species like argon, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. So the idea is that as the atmosphere escapes to space, the lighter isotopes, they've got a lower mass and they can escape more easily from the planet, while the heavy ones tend to remain bound to the planet. And therefore, as the atmosphere escapes to space, it keeps enriching the atmosphere in the heavy isotopes. But not only these isotopic evidence tell us that indeed atmospheric loss has happened and has been substantial, 
but indeed if we couple it with evolution models, we can estimate the amount of each species that has been lost to space throughout history. So here you've got some estimates. And with this, what we can do is to actually reconstruct by looking at the estopic ratios in different species, we can reconstruct the composition and density of the atmosphere of early Mars. And we can understand how this liquid water and what were the conditions that allowed this liquid water to be sustained on the surface. However, making these kind of estimations, it's, it's tricky and it's difficult and we need information, accurate information about several parameters. So uh, one of them is about the past isotopic ratios, the present isotopic ratios, and then the, what it's the so-called escape fractionation factor. So this escape fractionation factor, essentially what determines is how quickly the atmosphere gets enriched in the heavy isotopes as the atmosphere escapes to space. And this is an important parameter. And how is this calculated? Well, it's calculated by looking at the relative isotopic composition between the upper atmosphere where the escape of the atmosphere happens with respect to the isotopic composition of the near surface atmosphere where most of the mass is. And not necessarily the isotopic abundances in these two regions of the atmosphere need to be the same. There are a number of atmospheric processes that might alter these isotopic abundances. And it is precisely in this middle atmosphere, in this transition between both that the trace gas orbiter makes its measurement. So can we actually say something about this? So this is what I will be talking about later. Now let me introduce the ExoMars mission. So this mission emerged as a collaboration between the European Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency, Roscosmos, and it was developed as a two-stage mission. So first of all, the Trace Gas Orbiter and Schiaparelli were launched in 2016, arriving to the planet on the same year. Schiaparelli got released to the surface and the Trace Gas Orbiter started at an aerobraking phase until it's re it reached its final circular orbit in 2018. And on March, 2018, the Trace Gas Orbiter started science operations. And then the second stage of the mission uh, it includes uh, the Rosalind Franklin rover and a surface platform that right now they are waiting to a new launch date. But let's look into a bit more detail into the Trace Gas Orbiter. Well, the payload includes four instruments. So there's CASIS, which is a high resolution stereo camera designed to take high resolution images of the surface. Then there's FRIEND, which is a neutron detector that aims to measure subsurface water. And then there are two suites of spectrometers, NOMAD and ACS. ACS is the atmospheric chemistry suite, and it's the one that I've been using for my studies. And it is a suite because it actually includes three spectrometers within it in, by in looking into different spectral ranges. So there's the near infrared channel, the middle infrared channel, and the thermal infrared channel. The one that I've been uh, using is the middle infrared channel, which is in the one that we can me measure the isotopic ratios. And one important thing to understand about this mission and why it is actually good at measuring trace gases is the kind of observations that, that it makes that are the so-called solar occultation observation. So in order to illustrate how this work, I made a small animation in which uh, here, well, in the top, I took some vertical profiles of pressure, temperature, the abundances of the CO2, carbon dioxide and water vapor, and also the dust abundance on the atmosphere. And I took this in order to simulate and to show you the kind of measurements, spectral measurements that we make. So how do these solar occultations work? Well, here the trace gas orbiter is represented by this blue dot and this yellow line represents the line of sight. And in these kind of measurements, we are always pointing at the sun as we move along the orbit. And as you can see, this tangent point in here starts lowering down. So when we are looking very high in the atmosphere, we are just observing the solar spectrum. But then uh, as we start moving, this tangent point starts going uh, lower down and we start observing the solar spectrum, but attenuated by the atmosphere. And we start seeing some spectral signatures, absorption features of different gases in the atmosphere. Typically in the upper atmosphere is CO2 because it's the most abundant gas in the atmosphere. But then uh, as we start going lower down, we start seeing the spectral signatures of water vapor, for example, in this simulation. But this also applies to other gases and to the isotopes. And then when we get closer to the surface, there's dust that absorbs light at all wavelengths. And 
there's basically a point in which the atmosphere is so opaque that it extincts all the signal. But what we do is that, well, we've taken several measurements at different tangent altitudes. So with our radiative transfer codes, if we invert all these measurements all together, we can reconstruct these vertical profiles in the atmosphere. And then there are two reasons why these kind of observations are actually good at measuring trace gases. The first one is, as, as you can see here by this yellow line, we are always looking at the limb. And the limb, uh, the air mass that we are observing, is about 30 times greater than if we look directly at the surface. So that means that we've got an increased line of sight density, which essentially makes, a, makes us more sensitive to the trace gases. And the second reason is that, as I said, we are always pointing to the sun in these kind of observations. And the sun is a bright source of light and that yields high signal to noise ratio measurements, which is uh, ideal if we want to measure uh, trace gases in a planetary atmosphere. So now that we know how the trace gas orbiter makes its observations, let, let's get into the science topics. So let's look at the isotopic composition of Mars atmosphere. Well, so using these, uh, kind of observations, we've been monitoring the, the oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen isotopic compositions in water vapor, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide. So here you can see a summary figure of all the measurements that we've made in these different species. So here is the oxygen isotopic ratio. So this is the heavy isotope divided by the light isotope, and the same for carbon and for hydrogen. But I'm going to go into a bit more detail uh, into each of these topics. Let's start with the isotopic composition of water vapor. So essentially we applied this scheme to, in order to, well, but looking at a spectral range in which we could see the isotopic signatures uh, of water vapor. So here you can see an example in which each of these lines corresponds to a different isotope in water vapor. And by looking at these at the, at the different altitudes, we can reconstruct the abundances of the different isotopes of water vapor. And with that, we can derive the isotopic ratios. And we take loads of measurements. So we can actually apply this same retrieval scheme to 1.5 Martian years of operations, and we can look at the seasonal variations. And what is it that we observe when we do that? Well, what we observe is that there are drastic seasonal variations related to the Mars sun's, uh, sun distance. So during aphelion, when Mars is farther away from the sun and it is summer in the Northern hemisphere, what we observe is, well, here in, in this figure, what you can see is the water vapor abundance. So during this period, and that is the blue line, we can see high water vapor abundances, but they de decrease very rapidly with altitude. And for the D2H ratio that is shown here, we observe high values of the D2H ratio of about four or five, but they steadily decrease with altitude as well, following the same trend as the water vapor abundance. And during perihelion, when Mars is closer to the sun, in this case, the solar insulation is greater, the atmosphere is warmer, and the atmospheric circulation is stronger. So that actually allows water vapor to rise to the upper atmosphere or to the middle, uh, middle atmosphere. And we observe high abundances of water vapor up to very high altitudes. And it is the same kind of trend for the D2H ratio. We observe high values of the D2H ratio until approximately 50 kilometers in which they start to decrease. But why are the isotopic ratios changing at all? Why are not HDO and H2O behaving on the same way? Well, this is because the different isotopes, they undergo the same reactions, but they are slightly different. So they undergo the same reactions, but at a slightly different rates. And in particular for water vapor, what happens is that water ice clouds form and the efficiency of HDO and H2O to condense is not the same. So the HDO condensation, so the heavy isotope condensation is a bit more efficient. So when these water ice clouds form, HDO tends to condense and that creates a depletion of the D2H ratio in the atmosphere. And with this, we can conclude that most of the variations that we observe in the atmosphere of Mars are uh, in water vapor are driven by this uh, condensation induced fractionation. And then what is it that we observe for the isotopic composition of carbon dioxide? Well, in this case, we observe much less variability, but we indeed observed uh, some variations. And in particular, we observed some variations with altitude. So 
approximately above 100 kilometers, we observed a decrease of the heavy isotopes with altitude. And why does this happen? Well, approximately on Mars at 100 kilometers, there's the, there's the homopause. And the homopause is a boundary that separates two regions of the atmosphere. So below we've got the, homo, uh, the homosphere in which the, there's turbulent mixing in the atmosphere and all the species are uniformly mixed and they share a common scale height, which means that they vary with, uh, vertically uh, similarly with altitude, with a similar scale height. However, above the homopause, there's the heterosphere in which molecular diffusion dominates. And this molecular diffusion depends on the mass, which means that each species will vary vertically according to their own scale height. And as the isotopes, they have a slightly different masses. They, they, they have similar masses, but slightly different we expect the, the density of the heavy isotopes to decrease more rapidly than the density of the light isotopes. So if we wanna estimate analytically how this decrease should be, we just need to take into account the densities of both species and considering this delta mass, which is the difference in mass between both isotopic ratios. And that is what is shown by this black dashed line. And also uh, one way that we can make sure that indeed it is this molecular diffusion that is causing this decrease of the isotopic ratios with altitude is that we can look at the relative decrease in the oxygen isotopes in, and in the carbon isotopes. So this is because when we talk about the oxygen isotopes, it is typically the oxygen 18 over the oxygen 16. So here the delta mass is two. However, when we look at the carbon isotopes, the difference in mass now is carbon 13 minus car carbon 12, it's just one. So we expect the variations in the carbon-13 isotopic ratios to be approximately half of the ones in oxygen. And when we took our measurements above 100 kilometers and we plotted that, we observed this correlation that has a slope of 0 0.53, which is pretty close to the slope of 0 0.5 predicted by the mass-dependent fractionation. And then finally, what do we see for the isotopic composition of carbon monoxide? Well, in this case, we measured again the isotopic composition of oxygen on the right and of carbon on the left. So on the right, we observed that in general, we cannot really distinguish between the isotopic composition of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. However, when we looked at the isotopic composition of carbon, we observed that this is depleted in the heavy isotopes with respect to CO2. And at first, uh, we were not really sure why this was happening. We would expect both compositions to be approximately similar. So in order to interpret this depletion and understand what's going on, what we did is to look at the photochemical relation between these two species. And in particular, the, well, the chemical reactions that uh, relate these two species are the same chemical reactions that actually control the stability of CO2 in the Martian atmosphere. So these reactions start with the photolysis of CO2, and this is when UV photons break up the CO2 molecules into CO and atomic oxygen. And then there's the recombination of these photolysis products back into CO2. So at first it, it was not well understood why CO2 was stable in the atmosphere of Mars, because the recombination of the products, so CO and oxygen, this reaction is very slow. So it was, it was not understood the, the atmosphere of Mars should be dominated or should uh, CO, the carbon monoxide should be more abundant. But then it was re later realized that it's actually this reaction in here, the carbon monoxide plus the hydroxyl radical OH, this reaction is very fast and can recombine CO back into CO2 at a much faster rate. So what we did is to include these reactions into a photochemical model but not only accounting for the reactions themselves, but also for the isotope effects. And in particular, we saw that one of the most important parameters is that the photolysis of CO2 for the different isotopes, it is not equally efficient. In particular for the carbon 12, it's more efficient. So that means that more carbon 12 for carbon monoxide is produced. And that requires a de or that predicts a depletion of the uh, isotopic ratios in CO. So when we included these cross sections into our photochemical model, this is uh, what we derived. So here, what you can see, these dashed lines are the predictions by the photochemical model. 
here, this green dot represents the measurement of the isotopic ratio measured by the Curiosity rover. And for CO2, what the photochemical model predicts is that this isotopic ratio should be fairly constant with altitude until we reach 100 kilometers and then it starts decreasing. And this is caused because of the molecular diffusion and the diffusive separation effect that we saw before. However, for carbon monoxide, what the photochemical model predicts is that the isotopic ratio should be depleted because of this photolysis effect. And indeed, what the photochemical model predicts is in pretty good agreement with the observations. So taking into account all these processes, it's actually important because I, as I explained before, for estimating the escape fractionation factor and the long-term evolution of the atmosphere, we need to first constrain how the isotopic ratios of the near surface atmosphere are with respect uh, to the ones in the upper atmosphere. And we are observing a strong variability in the isotopes, which needs to be taken into account. So I will leave the conclusions here. So, well, the trace gas orbiter has been operating now for four or five years, and it has been uh, providing unprecedented detail on the vertical structure of different atmospheric parameters. In particular, I'm most interested in the isotopic ratios because I think that it's very cool that they can allow us to reconstruct how the atmosphere of Mars four billion years ago was. But in order to make those estimations, we need to estimate this escape fractionation factor and we really need to understand what's going on in the atmosphere in order to provide accurate estimations of the long-term evolution. And we saw that indeed several processes can alter the isotopic ratios in the atmosphere. In the case of water, it is the condensation to water ice clouds. On the case of carbon dioxide, it is the transport in the atmosphere and the mixing. And in the case of carbon monoxide, it is a photochemical reactions uh, producing this alteration. So we need to actually consider all these things if we want to understand properly the long-term evolution of the atmosphere. And I will leave it here and I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I invite questions from the floor here and online, and please identify yourself if possible, if you remember your name when uh, asking the question. Any questions? Yes, well, I'll ask one while we're waiting. Um, so what was the original atmospheric composition <laughs> of Mars, or, or are you not ready to be able to? Well, I think that needs further work. So, well, my work has been focused on measuring these kind of processes, but you need to consider like an evolution model. And there, it is not only the escape of the atmosphere that can fractionate these isotopes over the long term. There's also outgassing from mm -hmm. the surface. Uh, and there are all sorts of parameters also, like maybe all the water instead of escaping to space, maybe it went into the crust, something that we don't know, but these kind of measurements and even the isotopic the effect that different processes produce in the isotope, maybe if we know how they are actually affected, we might be able to understand what's going on. And there'd have been volcanic activity as well, possibly yeah. as well. So. Yeah. I guess, I guess, yeah. and was it like the early Earth's atmosphere or? From what I've seen, I've seen so many things. Uh, some papers say, say that CO2 was very abundant on Mars, but then I read that it is not so abundant. Maybe okay. it was nitrogen in okay. the atmosphere. Well, we'll obviously have to get you back in a few years when you <laughs> yeah. tell us. <laughs> okay, questions from the floor. Yes, Christopher. Yes, Christopher Taylor here. Um, you said that deuterium um, on Mars is about five times more abundant than uh, on the Earth and attributed that to the escape fractionation factor. I, can I just correct you a bit? I think those were ratios relative to Earth's. Relative to the Earth. Yes, then they weren't raw ratios. They were yeah. ratios. No, but but the deuterium relative to um, hydrogen one um, is five times more abundant on Mars than it is on the Earth. Yes, as I understood you to say, um, and and yet, I mean, I may be terribly out of date on this, but but from reading donkeys years ago, I thought that um, the ratio in the atmosphere of Jupiter was about five times what it is on yeah. Earth. And in that case, there's no chance, of, surely, of, of um, escape fractionation because the escape velocity of the planet is so much higher. 
the yeah. molecular velocity even at H2 is that, that it would all be, um, be trapped and there'd be no fractionation there. Yeah. So would, would you like to comment on that? I, I think that comes like, what was the original fractionation of D2H when Mars was formed? And it is assumed that the, the D2H ratio original on Mars, the primordial one, was similar to the Earth, but not necessarily the one on Jupiter was similar to the one on Mars and the Earth. And this is well how it is typically done, is you use uh, isotopic measurements in Martian meteorites. Mm. And that's what you use, actually. So typically, this, uh, with respect to Earth, is just to give a baseline. But typically, when you estimate the amount of atmosphere or the amount of water that has been lost, you look at the past isotopic ratio from Martian measurements, uh, from Martian meteorites, and the current isotopic ratio in the atmosphere. And that's what you use in order to make the estimation. Thank you. Uh, any questions online yet? No? Yes. OK. Any further One there. Uh, Paul Wheat, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, as I understand it, I don't think there's a magnetic field on Mars. And therefore, the incoming solar radiation and the particles are much more severe, including the ultraviolet, than they are on Earth. How much does that affect the atmospheric chemistry? And not having a magnetic field, uh, I'm not sure. That's a short answer. Uh, but yeah, well, actually, uh, it is not it is not really known. I think when Mars lost its magnetic field or why it lost it, but that definitely affects the escape rates because the the magnetic field is not held in the planet and the particles from the sun uh, they actually increase the, the escaping rates because of yeah photochemical interactions uh, between these charged particles and the the atmosphere but i'm not really sure how it changes the chemistry itself thank you i think that's it okay well thank you very much indeed thank you Um, the next uh, speaker today I'm, I'm pleased to introduce is Dr. Rebecca Smethurst, uh, who won the Winston A Award on the growth uh, of supermassive black holes. Uh, Rebecca is the Royal Astronomical Society Research Fellow at the current time in the University of Oxford. Her work specializes in the growth of supermassive black holes and the impact of AGN feedback that results from that growth. She's part of the SDSS Magna and the Galaxy Zoo collaborations and was recently awarded the Royal Astronomical Society's Winston Award for research by a postdoctoral fellow in astronomy, whose career has shown the most promising development. And as many of you know too, she does an awful lot of work uh, on public understanding and is well known for her podcasts, I believe. So, Rebecca. All right, thank you for that lovely introduction, uh, Mike. First of all, I'd just like to apologize for the slight rasp in my voice. The Oxford Astrophysics Department had their Christmas party on Wednesday evening and someone went a little bit too hard singing karaoke to Bonnie Tyler. Um, <laughs> anyway, today I'm here to talk about the growth of supermassive black holes, which I often like to remind people is actually rather difficult. You know, you have to have some process that moves material from perfectly stable orbits in a galaxy uh, transferring angular momentum essentially so that material can be accreted by the supermassive black hole in the center. And there are a few processes that we think can do that, not least the merger of two galaxies. But I'm hoping to be able to convince you today that the dominant way that that happens, you know, hopefully a little review of the field of the past decades and my own research as well, that the dominant way that happens is not by the merger of two galaxies, but actually processes internal to a galaxy. So I'm just gonna start with just a quick review because we wanna bring everyone up to speed on essentially why we should care about galaxy evolution. So 
Let's start with this. This is our field's bread and butter plot, essentially. You've got the stellar mass of the central bulge of a galaxy on the x-axis, as so beautifully demonstrated by Andromeda there. And then on the y-axis, you've got the mass in the galaxy's central supermassive black hole. And hopefully what you can see in this plot is that there is at least an astronomer's correlation there, right? A rough correlation. And this is where this idea comes from, that galaxy mergers are the dominant processes driving what we know as co-evolution, the co-growth, if you will, of a galaxy and its supermassive black hole, because mergers are able to cause this redistribution of angular momentum, moving stars from perfectly stable orbits, rotationally supported system, down to what we know as a dispersion supported system, essentially this geometric bulge of stars in the middle of a galaxy. Now, the more comparable the ratios are in two galaxies that come together and merge, so what we call a one-to-one -one ratio of mass, the more likely you, you are to form a bulge. So if you have a very dry merger, so a merger of two galaxies that doesn't have a lot of gas in it, and the two galaxies are roughly the same mass, you're gonna form something essentially that is all bulge, an elliptical galaxy. If you have something that we call a minor merger, where perhaps one galaxy is much smaller than another, and you're not gonna form something that's purely elliptical, you're gonna instead build a bulge in the center of your nice stellar disk that you have. For those who aren't familiar and who want an analogy, I like to think of this as a fried egg, essentially. The disk is the egg white, the bulge is the egg yolk in the center. And so we have this very nice scaling relation that we attribute it to galaxy mergers. But we see this as well, not just for the bulge on the x-axis, but you could put galaxy total mass on the x-axis. You could put size of galaxy on the x-axis. You could even put velocity dispersion as well of the stars in that central bulge on the x-axis. And we think that this coevolution of these two things must be regulated by some process to stop galaxies from growing too large. And now the assumption comes from the fact that we have this. It comes from what we know as the observed luminosity function of galaxies. That's what I'm showing here the data, by the data points. They're from the classic Benson et al. 2003 paper for those who are familiar. And essentially what the luminosity function tells you is you do a count essentially of how many galaxies of different sizes you see across the universe as in brightness, equivalent to mass here. So you've got how many faint galaxies do you see? How many bright galaxies do you see? And then a common check you can do of all of your simulations is to say, do we reproduce those observations? And hopefully what you can see here in the dashed line is that roughly 20 years ago, they didn't match at all. And that was with our best model of the universe, Lambda CDM. And one thing people realized was that actually, you know, those simulations were missing a process. They were missing this process that we call AGN feedback. So AGN, active galactic nuclei, a growing, accreting, supermassive black hole that is feeding back energy into the galaxy. So through an outflow or a wind or a jet, when that accretion essentially rate gets too much, and essentially some of that material is turned away from the accretion disk and back into the galaxy. If we add that process, we actually find that at least at the high mass end of galaxies, things start to match again. You can actually reconcile the low mass end as well if you have a similar process, but with supernova feedback, essentially blowing out your smaller uh, galaxies there. However, there is a huge disconnect between theory and observers like myself. Because theorists have been convinced for 20 years that this must therefore be the case. Observers, however, we haven't found any evidence of this happening across a very large population of galaxies. I give you a ream of ones where it's in individual cases showing, oh, look, there's along this outflow, along this jet, there's star formation been stopped in a galaxy and these galaxies aren't growing this big anymore, or perhaps even positive feedback where you see the outflow from a black hole trigger more star formation in some cases as well. But not across the entire galaxy pay population like you need to happen in simulations. I feel like it's been a bit of an elephant in the room every time we come together, observers and theorists. So I feel like there's more, more talk need to be uh, done across the room. Because I think, actually, if you think about it, without AGM feedback, Lambda CDM, our best model of the universe, fails. Which I'd argue is the biggest challenge to Lambda CDM, but I think the cosmologists in the room would argue against that with the Hubble tension that's currently escalating. Anyway. 
The best indirect evidence we have that this happens across the entire galaxy population is that correlation that I showed you before. This correlation between the mass of the supermassive black hole and the mass of the galaxy that says if you grow one, you grow the other. But if something stops growing the other, like AGM feedback from the growth of the black hole, then you have this correlation. However, there's been a fair few results that have challenged this paradigm of galaxy mergers causing this coevolution and regulating this growth through feedback. So to pick out just a few here, we've got Sigata Gaviraj's work back from 2013 that showed that at redshift two, so the peak of star formation activity and black hole accretion rate in the universe is seen on the classic Medal plot that I put in really small up there, but hopefully you can see it. At redshift two, that is the peak of star formation and black hole growth in the universe. But at that peak, only 27% of that star formation is triggered by galaxy mergers, suggesting that perhaps also the black hole growth is not powered by galaxy mergers. That was observations if we switch to simulations like uh, from Andrew Ponson et al. in 2017. They modeled the merger of two galaxies with AGM feedback and saw, okay, what is the star formation rate doing after the merger? And they found if you switched black hole accretion back uh, off, after the merger, then the galaxy would start forming stars again, growing in mass. Nothing would be regulating its growth, stop it from growing too big. That though is two giga years after the merger has happened, two billion years. So that's accretion onto that black hole is not fueled by a merger anymore. That's fueled by something else. So we need something fueling black hole growth that's not galaxy mergers. On top of that, I then very recently found uh, this result buried in a Millennium Simulation paper um, from Parry Aiken Frank back in 2009. And it shows that if you look at bulge growth, this one thing that I said, this is caused by galaxy mergers. If you look at bulge growth, that's also not dominated by galaxy mergers until you get above sort of 10 to the 11 solar masses for galaxies. I'm shown in the red line there. Under that mass, it's dominated by disk instabilities, instabilities in the spiral disk of the galaxy itself, driving stuff, uh, driving stars towards the center. So not only is black hole growth apparently not fueled by mergers, neither is bulge growth either that it's correlated with. So I'm hoping after this fairly quick review, you'll agree with me that studying how galaxies and supermassive black holes are growing in the absence of galaxy mergers is a good idea, <laughs> which is what the group that I work with, Brooke Simmons especially, had this idea uh, a few, maybe even a decade ago now, I think. Um, so how do we actually go about doing that and testing that, whether black holes can grow in the absence of mergers? Well, the one way that we decided to do it, and therefore the way I'm gonna talk about in the rest of this talk, is by looking at galaxies like this. Uh, a bulgeless galaxy, something that is completely disk dominated. Now, the morphology of a galaxy is incredibly important. It encodes its evolutionary history. Like I said before, if you have a galaxy merger, you form an elliptical galaxy. If you don't have any mergers, you keep your spiral structure and your disk shape. So hopefully that's what you can see here. You can also see there's a very bright point source in the middle that you might be thinking, isn't that a bulge? No, that is the very bright point source of the AGN, the hydrogen gas in the accretion disk lighting up for us to see. So because these are disk dominated, we assume that they've not had a merger with another galaxy since at least redshift two, because otherwise it would show up in the morphology. Finding a sample of these things though is very difficult because it is very rare that you do find a galaxy that has been essentially left alone for the past 11 billion years of its evolution. On top of that, AGN are also 10% of the galaxy population or so. So it was a rare object combined with another rare object. And of course, these pesky AGN that actually, they're not pesky because we actually want to care about them, but they are pesky in this sense. They masquerade as bulges as well. So it's not something you can ask the untrained eye, so citizen scientists to do, um, but it is something that you have to go through and look at yourself and eyeball lots of images to pick them out. So for example, here I'm showing over the hundred of these that we eventually picked out from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And hopefully, you know, you and I can see at least that they're mostly disk dominated, but they do have this bright point source of the AGN in the middle that's almost purplish 
compared to the blue or the yellow light of the, the galaxy, the stellar disk around the outside. And that's really the flag for saying, yes, these are unobscured AGN. We can tell these are AGN. Actually picks these out in X-ray first. They're incredibly, incredibly luminous. They're growing at almost the maximum rate you would think this is possible for a disk galaxy that's not had a merger. We're fairly confident, though, that we picked out pure disks, even though this bright point source of the AGN could be hiding a bulge underneath it. And we actually did have that confirmed with the HST survey that uh, we, we did. I just showed one of the images from as well. But once we had this sample, I think we had SDSS spectra for a lot of these. We did go to the INT and get a few more for those that didn't have it. And with that, you could then look at the H alpha emission line, the hydrogen emission that's coming from the accretion disk of the black hole. You can look at its, um, uh, its, its broadening essentially and through a virial assumption, you get it, the supermassive black hole mass. You can then also work out, all right, if there is a bulge hiding under that bright point source of the AGN, how big would it be? That's the maximum limit that it could be. And with all of that information, you can then put it on that diagram that we saw before, this classic co-evolution relation. And you'll see all the points I've added are mostly these arrows, their upper limits. That's the bulge you could be hiding under the point source of the AGM. Now we expected these to be essentially off the bottom left corner of this plot. If mergers grow black holes and galaxies, they should be way down off the end. They should have very small supermassive black holes. But hopefully what you can see is if you take into account even that those upper limits probably mean they're going to shift somewhere to the left on that plot because their bulges are smaller than what we can necessarily pick out from under the AGN light, you'll see that they've managed to grow to yeah, supermassive proportions. In some cases, 10 to the 9 solar masses, as big as any supermassive black hole in an elliptical galaxy that you would expect to see, as I'm showing in those red points that we saw so early on uh, in the talk there. The other thing we can do is we can take into account the fact that those are limits and we can make a nice fit for where they're probably going to shift to and what correlation line you would draw. It's a dicky bow shape, essentially, because you could put a vertical line in there. You know, there's no correlation, essentially, which isn't surprising. If you're thinking about a galaxy that doesn't have a bulge, there is no relation between bulge and supermassive black hole. As I said, this was a bit of a surprise that these supermassive black holes could be so big in these galaxies. There is clearly another process that is not galaxy mergers that has grown these black holes to such an incredible amount. So, as I said, conversations between observers and theorists are very important. So we turned to our simulation friends down the corridor, essentially, and said, could they check in their simulations, if they picked out galaxies that have not had a merger, do they find the same thing? So this next plot that I'm gonna show is work I've done with Ricarda Beckman at Cambridge with the Horizon AGN simulation team, which for all of those of you who this means something to, it's a hydrodynamical simulation and a cosmological volume that employs the adaptive mesh refinement code Ramses. I'll have a breathe after that. And essentially what I hope you can see is when they've selected out galaxies that have not had a merger, we can see almost where those upper limits I was showing before will shift to. We can now get at the exact bulge mass. And there's a nice correlation here. Yes, there's a lot of scatter, but if you look at how this relates, the colored points there have been uh, colored by bulge to total mass ratio. So how much of a percentage of the galaxy actually is the bulge? 100% being an elliptical galaxy, much lower being disk dominated. You can see almost basically all that's gonna happen is that line you're gonna fit there is gonna shift to the right as your bulge mass increases. And this is without galaxy mergers. That's bulge growth, supermassive black hole growth without galaxy mergers. And amazingly, we also see the same thing if we pick out all the merging things too. It's just a slightly tighter uh, relation and also slightly higher in mass as well. But we've clearly got evidence here for co-evolution, correlation between these two things in the absence of mergers. Obviously, one of the great things you can do with simulations is then you can go and say, okay, let's actually look what's been going on over the entire history of the universe and see where did this mass actually come from. So this was work that we actually did back in 2018. This was led by Gareth Martin. Um, and he essentially looked at um, the cumulative growth of black holes over the history of the universe. So you've got redshift on uh, the x-axis there and then this cumulative growth of black holes on the y-axis. 
The dash lines, the dotted line is those minor mergers I was talking about. The, the uh, dash line is the major mergers and the solid line is those two things added together. The solid line is the contribution to all the mass in black holes from galaxy mergers over the entire history of the universe. And if you follow it all the way to the left-hand side of that diagram to today, essentially at redshift zero, you find that 35% of all the mass in black holes is due to galaxy mergers. The rest is something else, <laughs> is non-merger processes. And this was, again, so surprising to us. It shows that mergers aren't dominant at all in this coevolution. In fact, they, they clearly don't dominate. And it's not just Horizon AGN, you see this. The folks up at Durham and the Eagle simulation have also seen this. They actually found only 15% of the massive supermassive black holes they could attribute to galaxy mergers. So combining these observations and simulations, we have almost this new way of looking at black hole growth, and black hole and galaxy coevolution, where you have this underlying dominant growth through some merger-free process um, that's sort of dominating in the very long epochs between galaxy mergers. You know, and the growth might be slightly boosted by a merger whenever those do happen. And then obviously they have a big impact on the morph morphology of the galaxy. And that's what you end up making conclusions about. And there's been sort of the red herring in the field for 20 or 30 years, essentially. So it appears as if coevolution driven by merger-free processes is dominant. But there's obviously two big outstanding questions then. If we think about what I uh, said at the beginning of the talk, if you've got coevolution in the absence of mergers, is it still regulated by AGM feedback? Like we think in the merger case. And two, I just keep saying merger free and it must be very frustrating for you because you must be wondering, well, what on earth is actually causing this coevolution and this growth then? So let's start with the first one there. What we did was actually picked out four of these um, brightest of these bulgeous galaxies uh, observing uh, with AGN. And we observed them with KCWI, the Keck Cosmic Web Imager uh, up uh, in Mount Kea. It doesn't give us quite as high a resolution picture as I'm showing in the HST images here. Unfortunately, it looks something more like this, uh, seeing very seeing limited, only about 1.1 arc seconds essentially, but we do get a spectrum at every single pixel. So that looks something like this in the center of one of these sources here. You've got the data there shown in the black line. I've got the fit that data in the red. And hopefully what you can see in all of those different components that I've split it into below that data there is the hallmark, first of all, of an unobscured AGN, that bright pink line I'm showing, nice broadened emission that's coming from the accretion disk. You've then also got the little green component, that's ionization thanks to star formation or from the central AGN. And you've got these extra components in this emission here, the blue components that I'm showing there uh, on the screen that are blue shifted and broadened. That is the hallmark of an outflow from these AGM. Something, you know, gas you've got that is moving differently to the, um, the gas around it. And it's these observations that allowed us essentially to at least try and answer some of those two questions that I just posed. So first of all, after we, you know, found these outflows, first thing you gotta do is actually check, okay, are they ionized by the AGM and not by star formation? So for those who aren't familiar, this is a classic diagnostic from the Bulb and Phillips and Tillovich diagram, BPT di diagram, where you look at the ratio of O3 over H beta. Basically, blue areas, AGN ionization, red areas, star formation. So on the outskirts, you see star formation. On the inside, you see AGN. Not a surprise, but what we wanted to know was those broad components, the outflow, as you can see, all colored blue here, this was an outflow from the AGN, which was incredibly exciting in the first place to have merger-free outflows. We always thought if enough material makes it down to the black hole without a merger, you're lucky. But it turns out not only can you grow the black hole, you can power an outflow that could be causing AGM feedback. And that's the big question. Could these outflows stop star formation in these galaxies? So what we did was we looked at the velocities of these outflows. They are quite large, larger than I was expecting. You can see one of them, 1,710 kilometers a second speed there. And then we looked at the escape velocity at, that, at the greatest extent of that outflow and actually found that the outflows were, had velocities that were 30 times larger on average than the, um, the escape velocity of the galaxy. 
So that suggests that these outflows could be actually expelling gas needed for future star formation in these galaxies, stopping the galaxy from growing too large and hopefully regulating any of the, the growth of the, the supermassive black hole and the, and the galaxy that there, uh, that there's coevolution that is occurring as well, which is a very, very exciting uh, result for us. Then the question was, okay, well, what actual processes is powering these um, uh, this growth as well as we can see here, this coevolution that we've shown is happening in the absence of mergers that now we also suggest is regulated by AGM feedback, you know, is almost a bombshell, but we still don't know what process is causing it. So thankfully those outflows we detected also help here because if you can measure the outflow rate and you can measure what rate that the black hole is accreting at from the luminosity of the AGN that we saw before in those, those purple point sources in all those images, you can work out some lower limit on the amount of gas that's actually being funneled to the center of these galaxies. And if you know the amount of gas that's being funneled to the center, you can at least try and say, okay, well, in simulations, what processes are capable of driving that amount of gas in the absence of mergers? So the range and inflow rates we found are about 0.18 to 0.77 solar masses a year, again, perhaps larger than we were expecting. But we found that actually in simulations, bars, spiral arms, cold accretion from the cosmic web, all capable of driving inflows to the center of these galaxies at those rates. And while all of these galaxies I'm showing do have spiral arms, you could also argue that all of them have some form of a bar as well, maybe a bar lens if we're going to get really, really technical. And if you look at the rates that they're capable of, of driving inflows at, 0.1 to a few solar masses a year, not only would you have you know, enough to cover the inflow rates that we found here, but then also say if you have some inflow that's then used in star formation or just dumped in a central reservoir or whatever, because this... Uh, this thing I've got here down here, this uh, inequality is, is a very large assumption, right? You're missing out a lot of things from, from the galaxy. So it's comforting to know that you could do this and a lot of other things as well if you have a bar in a galaxy. But I think what these results confirm is that non-merger processes easily fuel the, super, the growth of supermassive black holes and power AGN outflows, whether that's bars, funneling by spiral arms or accretion uh, from, uh, from the cold uh, cosmic web as well. So the other thing, the last thing we did was also compare these to uh, the energetics of outflows from your very typical unobscured AGN in the local universe. You know, how do they compare to the general population? And hopefully what you can see here is that in all the things we looked at, outflow rate in the top panel, kinetic energy outflow rate, momentum flux, they're fairly normal. They're not weird at all, which in itself is a very weird result because these have been selected to be in very strange galaxies that don't fit with the norm. And yet here we are saying that they are the norm in the local redshift population. But if we remember that result from the Horizon AGN simulation that showed that actually at redshift zero, you know, 65% of the mass of supermassive black holes has come from non-merger processes. And the fact that these aren't weird suggests that again, with this result, the reason they're not weird is because the low redshift AGM population is dominated by merger-free processes as well. It perhaps is the norm to have non-merger powered feedback. So we're doing a couple of more different uh, studies with Horizon AGN as well. I just want to focus on this one for now because I think this is really interesting because it's something that people have looked at uh, in the past with observations as well, which is the alignment of any uh, black hole spin that you have and therefore any outflow from that black hole and then the galaxy spin itself. So do you have the two things aligned or do you have the two things uh, anti-aligned? And that can affect how much of an impact the feedback that outflow has on the galaxy as well. And in merger-free grown black holes, we found that they're much more likely to be aligned than anti-aligned. So that's what the blue distribution is showing there whereas the gray is dominated by mergers. And that makes sense if we think about how these things could be growing. If it's all coming from the galactic disk, it's all coming from the same angular momentum vector, you're gonna spin up your black hole and therefore also uh, have that spin be aligned with the galaxy spin as well, and you'd result with this. And I think it would be great to actually test that with the Hubble Space Telescope data as well to see, do the outflows that you detect, are they uh, almost, anti-aligned with the galactic disk because they're coming from a black hole that's spinning that is aligned with it 
as well. So this is sort of future work that I think would be incredibly uh, great to do. If we did find that though, one thing HSD then couldn't tell us necessarily is what impact those outflows are having. Ideally, we'd love to do it with the data we already have with KCWI, but it only looks at the blue side of the optical region. It doesn't look at the red, so you miss out on H-alpha, which is a great star formation diagnostic, and you can't resolve that either across the whole disk. So saying where there's an outflow, where there isn't an outflow, is there having an impact on the star formation rate? To do that, you need something like Muse, which is every astronomer's dream, right? Muse on the VLT down in Chile. The resolution is incredible. The wavelength range is incredible. You could test that with Muse to say, are these outflows that are powered by merger-free processes having an impact on the star formation, stopping galaxies from growing too big and actually regulating this growth that they seem to be dominating, which is what simulations have suggested. So I'm just gonna wrap up nice and quickly for you. We saw that non-merger processes easily fuel this, the growth of supermassive black holes, perhaps even 65% of all that growth as well which is staggering, definitely overturning this long-held paradigm that mergers grow supermassive black holes. They're also able to power outflows as well, and maybe even cause AGM feedback through uh, stopping star formation and stopping galaxies from growing too big. And also, these non-merger outflows are typical of low redshift AGN, suggesting that this could be dominating at low redshift. Finally, we still want to know what impacts these outflows have. This could be that smoking gum where observers and theorists haven't quite been able to agree. Maybe we've just been looking in the wrong place at merger-dominated galaxies when it's actually merger-free processes that are dominating uh, the growth, the outflows, and the feedback. And then is that feedback regulating that coevolution as well? Another big question we still want to know, hoping that with some future observations, HSD, Muse, is, uh, is going to solve those problems for us. So I'll leave you with that and just say thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Dr. Becky, as I believe would be the correct um, address, as it were. <laughs> Thank you very much. Questions, please. Lots of them. Let's start here. Uh, thank you, uh, Hannah Dalgleish. So from the sample of 101 that you mm -hmm. had, they all looked very much face on. Mm -hmm. Would that introduce any biases at all? Or? Yeah, it's an interesting question because I mean, the reason they're all face on is because we selected them first with X-ray studies. And so that would be an unobscured AGN. If we think about AGN unification, those ones that you see edge on are obscured AGN. So I would love to get a sample which is completely inclination bias free, except with unobscured AGN, you do have to rely on indirect methods to get it to massive black hole masses. It's not actually something that we have looked at necessarily that we do have a range in inclinations, they're not all face on, um, but it is something that would be cool to test. Thank you, next one, yeah. Once again, thank you, um, Darth Barber. Um, could you say something about the very high Z supermassive black holes, how they might have accreted? Yeah, so this is a huge problem in this field as well, is that how you get something so supermassive so soon uh, in the history of the universe. As far as I understand it, in simulations, they rely on a much larger seed black hole mass than can be formed in supernova. So they rely on black holes starting from 10 to the 5, solar masses 10 to the 4-ish, uh, and then accreting from there. What's interesting to think about is whether this merger-free accretion could actually help with that problem. Because with merger-free accretion, it could actually be more efficient because you would end up with a higher spin of the black hole, your innermost stable circular orbit on your accretion disk would decrease as well. It might just lead to an increase in luminosity, but it's interesting to think about whether that means that they are more efficient necessarily. And we are looking into that in, in terms of sort of ratios of outflow rates in those that are disk-dominated and those that are merger-dominated galaxies as well. Um, I think it would be something you could solve in simulations if you had a uh, higher resolution enough and also large enough cosmological volume, which those two things don't always go together, unfortunately. But with the new sort of mesh refinement simulations coming out, it might be possible. Anything online yet? No, come on online as ask your <laughs> questions. Right, over there, far corner. It's Bignev Kolindovich, theoretical physicist. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. You've Welcome. given me lots of ideas already. 
I would like to be, how can I put this? Um, a bit of a joke now. Okay. Uh, in the sense that it's coming up to Christmas. So in uh, five mega years, it won't matter to us anyway, because the earth won't be here. In five giga years, a large galaxy, the Andromeda, will collide with the Milky Way mm -hmm. and form, I suppose you could call it the Milky Andromeda. Milky meter is what I've heard it referred to. But. Now, my question, obviously, we won't be around to see it, but will it become an elliptical galaxy? Will it be too big to become an elliptical galaxy? And will there be a merger of the black holes or will the two rotate around each other and produce some sort of um, active galactic nuclei of some sort? Mm -hmm. Um, so with the Milky Way and Andromeda merger, I think we often think, like to think of it as a one-to-one -one merger because we like to think of ourselves as equal to Andromeda. But in fact, it would probably be a, classed as a minor merger since Andromeda is so much larger than the Milky Way. The idea is, yes, the supermassive black holes would merge in the center uh, afterwards. That in simulations takes a good couple of gig years post-merger for that to actually happen. And usually they have to sort of uh, not force it to happen, but sort of fudge it so that they finally eventually do merge in the center. Um, that would obviously lead to some accretion as well. Um, I think it wouldn't form an elliptical galaxy. It would form a geometric a, a bulge in the center with some disk around it. It's interesting though, when we think about the Milky Way, especially in terms of coevolution, when we look at the, the, the plot, that bread and butter plot I showed at the beginning, because the Milky Way's supermassive black hole is much smaller than it should be. So it's actually sort of in on the edge of the scatter of that diagram. So it's interesting to think whether the reason that we're all here in the first place is because the, the, we haven't really had a very active supermassive black hole. There hasn't been a lot of accretion. It hasn't led to outflows, jets, everything like that, at least for the past four billion years or so while the Earth was evolving necessarily. The, Earth do, the, Earth, the Milky Way uh, doesn't have a, a bulge. It has what's known as a pseudo bulge, so a concentration of stars in the middle, but it's not a geometric feature. It's, it's a, a sort of a disk feature in a way. Um, so it's interesting to think about how the Milky Way could actually be one of these uh, disdominated galaxies as well. Yeah. Question from online. And this question comes from Ardeel Desai, and I apologize if I've pronounced your name wrong. And the question is, can it be taken for granted that all galaxies have black holes at their center? That is the assumption, yes. Um, uh, simulations to support that as well. However, there have been a couple of recent claims of dwarf galaxies that do not, which I think is very interesting. It's whether we can't see them or necessarily, and also dwarf galaxies that we've been hunting for intermediate mass black holes in more than a supermassive black hole as well. But yes, the assumption is that all galaxies do you have a supermassive black hole, which then leads to the question, well, does the galaxy form first, the black hole form first in the early universe, which we still don't know. Okay, I think that's it. So shall we move on to the next one? Thank you very much. Thank you.